<laughs> yes, I will try. Hi, this is Melody Clark and my brother Mark Tanner. We're fan flat. And uh, we're waiting for our guests. Um, I'm suspecting there might be a technical problem. Uh, if not, then uh, we'll get through very quickly. And if so, then Mark and I are going to be discussing Dark Shadows. He recently saw his first three episodes. So because he is an expert in uh, all things horror and uh, in video cameras, <laughs> we can discuss what happens when... Uh... Ah, thank heavens. Hello, Mary. Hi, Melody. It's good to see you. You too. I was going to do a nice intro for you and stuff, but we've had technical problems this morning. Uh, that so, happens. Yeah, I, unfortunately, in, in the realm of, uh, in the Mickey and Judy want to throw a party uh, world of podcasting, that's uh, the way it is. Yes. Uh, anyway, this is my brother, Mark. Hi, Mark. And, it's nice great. to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mark. All stuff we'd have done earlier if it hadn't screwed up. Anyway. <laughs> I'm an expert on Dark Shadows now. I've seen three episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Which three? Which the time? First three. The first three. I started with three. number one. <laughs> That's why I was asking Melody if that was really uh, Jonathan Fred's hand reaching out of the coffin. <laughs> yeah. No, it was not. <laughs> oh, it wasn't his ad? No. Well, I no. figured why would they why would they waste a star for something where you can't even see his face? So it was about money. Yeah, they didn't want to pay him. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Pay pay somebody who's just glorified extra to do that bit. They probably just had a cameraman go. Well, it was prop dead. guy. Well, I got a kick out of the guy that opened the coffin. He reminded me of Dracula's partner with that crazy smile on his face Ren, the whole Ren, time. Renfield, right? Renfield. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Very much that. that so it's probably somebody saw that and said, hey, let's do that. Oh, well, that's what Dan Curtis was loved <laughs> Dracula as a yeah. youngster. He had watched it and it scared the bejesus out of him. Uh, so yes, he wanted to create uh, the Dracula version his way on TV. Hence, I thought it was really Really interesting the difference in the video quality from back then to to the end of the show, even just that time period. Well, remember that everything was shot live. Right. And te television was still in its infancy. It started in the 50s, late 50s. So they were trying to do special effects on Dark Shadows. They were unheard of in daytime television and even maybe nighttime television at that point. Um, a key, for heaven's sakes, which is... So from what I gather, uh, was unknown at the time, or fairly unknown. Um, the chroma key? Well, certainly, yes, they were using it in news broadcasts um, yeah. behind the weatherman. But yes, it was fairly new. And so they were really cutting edge at the time. You know, we don't, we, we today, when we look back, it's, it's hard to um, realize you know, that they were really attempting to do production that was not, daytime was primarily, you know, sit around the table and talk with family, visit the doctor, but very simple sets. And Dark Shadow sets were very involved in all the special effects, took a great deal of time, time away from rehearsal for the actors. Well, now we can do your intro. You, of course, know a lot about daytime. You've won seven Emmys producing yes. it. And uh, you have, let's see, what is what was your latest? Uh, the last uh, soap opera I worked on was The Young and the Restless. Um, the first one I worked on, uh, which was shot in New York City, was Guiding Light. Then I moved to Another World, which was also in New York, in Brooklyn, New York studio. And then I went to One Life to Live, then moved to California to do General Hospital, and then Young and the Restless. So, ah. two years. So, you've, you've got your experience. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, my my life is a soap opera. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> now, I have to ask a Star Trek question. Was yes. Jonathan Brakes on one of the shows that you did? Because I know he did some soap operas. No, I did not work with him, but I worked with his wife. Um, oh. the, Jeannie Francis, who was the character of Laura on General Hospital for many, many years, was um, married to Jonathan and they had two children and are still together today. So he was at the studio. Um, I met him there one time. I was also at a party where he was attending with the kids. It was a family uh, birthday party. Uh, so he, as I said, was around, but I don't know what, if he actually started on a soap or, of course, we all think of him as, as number one um, on Next Generation. Um, uh, but I, I don't know in terms of what he did in terms of his early career. All right, thanks. Well, the, um, how, in fact, did you meet Jonathan? Well, I had watched Dark Shadows when I was young. I came into it when they were just starting the Adam storyline, where he was trying to uh, get his life force into this dead body so that he wouldn't be a vampire anymore. A neighborhood friend, Joanne, had said, you've got to watch this show. It's wonderful and cool and creepy and all kinds of things. So I started to watch it and just really enjoyed it. And when um, it ended, it ended. And uh, I was very interested in theater. So when I went to college, I was very busy working on productions as well as taking all my classes. And when I graduated, I moved to New York City to work in theater, you know, off, off Broadway, off Broadway, and hopefully eventually Broadway. Um, but uh, it's very hard to make a living doing just theater. So I ended up um, looking for a job in a soap opera. I thought, well, soap operas year round. Um, I had watched them. I had, uh, after Dark Shadows for a while, I had watched One Life to Live. And so I said, let me try to oh, get into one of the daytime soap operas. And I did get hired at the soap opera Guiding Light. That was, uh, was in the production office and they still had electric typewriters at the time. And, um, and, a, yeah. <laughs> uh, and a huge copy machine. And um, so I was working there and I would, come home and I discovered that New Jersey Network was rerunning episodes of Dark Shadows. In fact, episodes I hadn't seen. So it was fun to come home because I think it was about 6.30 that it was on and I would just come in the door and watch episodes. And they announced that they were gonna be doing a Dark Shadows special with Jonathan Frid and everybody tune in. It would be a course of pledge-a-thon where people would donate money. So I watched it and Jonathan did two performance pieces. He did Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, and he also did a soliloquy from Richard III. And it was just wonderful. And then in the interview with the host, which is Frank Tenzar, he mentioned that he was working on a one-man show, that he had been performing it at Dark Shadows conventions. And wanted to, it was made up of the first part was roles that he had played that he felt influenced his performance of Barnabas, such as Macbeth, Richard III, Thomas Beckett from Urban Cathedral. So he did sections, um, monologues from those plays. And the second part was material fans had written and sent to him over the years, prose and poetry. So in this interview, he uh, talked about, this is what the show was, but he wanted to move it away from so much Dark Shadows to um, a broader audience. So I decided to write him a letter. So I wrote a letter in which I basically explained my theater background that I was now working in television, but I really would love to help him if he needed uh, any assistance with this theater piece. Um, a few days later, I was at home and a friend of mine had just arrived from San Francisco. She was gonna visit for the week. And I was telling her I said, well, you watch Dark Shadows. It's, it's about to be on in a few minutes. And the phone rang. I went to the phone, and this voice said, Mary Leary? I said, yes. He said, this is Jonathan Frid. Well, I was stunned. The timing was just unbelievable. And um, I said, yes. He said, I was most impressed with your letter. Uh, would you like to come to a meeting? I said, certainly. He said, I have another individual who's also expressed interest in helping with my one-man show. I'll invite him to come as well. So a few days later, um, I was in his apartment and meeting him and William McKinley, who was the other man who had written him a letter and said uh, he, after the special and said, you should do something more. And we just started talking about ideas. He 
Um, wasn't he did know he said I don't want to just stick with one author there are people Hal Holbrook doing Mark Twain um, there and he said I think I want more variety than that and I said great and um, William sort of had the assignment of looking for material and every weekend he would go to the library I was doing that as well as just trying to think about um, how the show would get out there I mean, I didn't have the experience of being what you might call a booking agent. Um, it was new territory for me. So I was calling a lot of people that I knew connected with colleges and what do you do? How do you get something done? And they said very important to go to a conference, which at the time had a very long title. It was Association of Conference of University. It was very long. And they later called it APAP, Association of Performing Arts Presenters. and they would be, I mean, at many places, even like summer camps, I remember for my son, you'd go into a large room and there were tables with exhibits and a representative who would talk about, you know, for my son's case, looking, oh, here's a sports camp, here's a drama camp. Um, well, here I was talking about a one-man show <laughs> that it really shouldn't be in a huge auditorium, you know, 200, 500 seats is ideal. Um, and then next to me might be a Broadway touring show or it might be a chamber quartet. Uh, it was a wide variety, it used to have, we'd go to dinner, those of us that were working there and get to know each other and from all over the country. Um, and that was the way to get bookings, uh, the best way. Um, and um, so in any case, um, going back a little bit, as um, Jonathan and I were working together, it was really determining how the show would be marketed. Um, because he put together, and we went through many different titles, um, villains, uh, reflections on evil, and he would do uh, practice sessions, not only at fan conventions, but he decided in his home to have rehearsals and invite fans. So William in the beginning was in charge of getting people to come to his apartment and rehearse, and he very seriously wanted critique it wasn't just tell me how wonderful I am. I really want to know, do you like this piece? Do you like how this is shaping up? And that helped formulate in the discussions he and I would have about how best, again, to get the show marketed. And it really came to that someone who's played a vampire, people would be interested in hearing him tell spooky tales. Um, he was hesitant at first because of course he didn't want people to think this is Barnabas, I said, no, we're not only just gonna have you read, reading Poe and King, we'll have comedy. So I had a wonderful short story that I had found by James Thurber, Mr. Preble gets rid of his wife. And it's this sort of a bumbly, bumbling brown down beaten man who just couldn't stand his nagging wife anymore. And he wants to get her to the basement and hit her overhead with a shovel. Well, it's so it's very, very funny because he's basically telling her what he wants to do. Um, that was one story I remember took a while to get the rights because what's one of the other things I was doing was contacting authors and asking if we could get the rights, how much the fee would be. Um, I remember a call I made to Andy Rooney one time. I, di I didn't think I'd actually talk to him. Usually I was talking to a representative, but Andy Rooney actually talked to me yeah, and he said, he wants to do what with my piece? You know, but um, in, in any case, we formed, the first show was called Jonathan Fritz Fools and Fiends. Right. And the first performance was at an amazing location. It was Salve Regina College, which is now Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. And on the campus at the time, in 1986, the boys' dormitory was Collinwood, also yes. known as Seaview, also known as Cary Mansion. Um, his performance was not in there. His performance was in a small theater in what they called um, a Megley Theater. And, um, but he of course was in front of the house and we took pictures and it was wonderful in the press to of course say the actor who played Barnabas has returned to the site of Collinwood. Um, but it got wonderful reviews. It was, it, was, it was really amazing because he was just so thrilled and he, he was a perfectionist and sometimes when you try to make things perfect, you, you don't quite get it done. And so I know William often says, Mary, you're the one who got it done <laughs> because you said, we have a booking, you're going to be going on stage. Because he kept trying different stories and again, inviting fans and okay, does this work, does that work? Um, he also um, had gotten a letter from Nancy, no, actually it was a review 
um, Nancy Kersey had one of the Dark Shadows festivals, it was a performance of Reflections on Evil. That was the version of the show. And she had written a critique in a theater publication. And um, it was sent to Jonathan. And then he said, well, let's meet with her. So we met with Nancy and he said he was looking for someone to help him with the connections, the narrative that would be between the stories. Um, so she helped with that. And then also I was being starting all the marketing and getting press kits together. And back in those days, there weren't websites. It was mass mailings um, and creating different brochures. And so um, Nancy helped with that. Um, and, you know, as we were getting everything formulated, Jonathan said, we need to make up, set this up as a business. So he and I became partners, co-producers in his company, which he called Clunes Associates. Um, that was the, uh, the banner under which he toured his one man shows and I would get the, the booking contracts. And it came where people said, what's Clunes? Well, it came from his grandmother, maternal grandmother was from Scotland. And when she, as a young girl came to, uh, it was Ontario, actually watered down Ontario was where his McGregor grandparents lived. Um, she actually called the family home Clunes. It was on the gate. And he loved his grandparents. He loved his time in Watered Down, where he really spent his summers. Uh, Hamilton was where he lived. Watered Down was uh, probably about 45 minutes away, uh, maybe longer in those days, transportation. And um, he he just had this connection to Clune. So he picked that name. I thought it was a my life. I love the sound of it. And that's what we formulated this theatrical partnership together. And uh, then he toured. You know, almost, I guess, the next eight years, eight, nine years, we toured and I was taking care of all the arrangements. You know, it was all the, the one woman behind the one-man show. <laughs> I, I was at a few of those. Um, it, I must tell a story. It sort of highlights, everybody thinks of Jonathan as being very debonair and um, sort of uh, provincial. <laughs> You know that sort of thing, but he had a wicked sense of humor, as you know. Yes. And yes. Uh, I, he had a lady who was active in fandom, dark shadows fandom, at the time. Her name was Sharon, and one of the titles he was working on for the one man show, at least you were tossing it around, was "The Evil That Men Do." Oh, that was another title. Yes, yes, and. Um, she was saying she wanted to put on a pregnancy belly and a uh, one of those card things they wear when they're advertising or they used to back in the day uh -huh. and walk up and down the street the evil that men do <laughs> and she said oh for god's sake don't tell Jonathan and I said are you kidding he'd roar <laughs> So we took a picture, and I honestly thought the man was going to hurt himself laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It evolved into another uh, name, I believe, another title. Oh, yes. There was a half a dozen different titles before he settled on uh, Fritz, Fools, and Fiends. Um, right. But yes, he, he was, in some ways, he would strike you as an old-fashioned gentleman. Uh, he definitely, he was had great manners. He was very considerate and kind to others, um, he raised very well. But he did have a great sense of humor. He was a fantastic storyteller and could tell some really funny stories. And um, it was great to, time to be with him. I mean, because he could be very entertaining. He always had something to say. Um, and because he was very, very um, well educated. So he could talk on many, many different subjects. And he had the ability, as much as he was a wonderful conversationalist, to also listen. He really wanted to take in the person he was speaking with, um, really get to know them, you know about the character or their background. So some people can be very superficial, but he was very sincere when he would meet with somebody and talk. So that was the amazing thing, as well as being this great storyteller, he was a really good listener. And he'd look you in the eye with something yes. unusual. Yes. yes. Mind if I jump in real quick? No, go right ahead, Mark. Yes, Mark. You know, he was such a good actor. I kind of wonder if he was ever upset because he got typecast as a vampire. Maybe 
you know, maybe wanted to play a doctor or, or something and never got the chance. What happened after Dark Shadows is, yes, he was typed being offered horror movies. And what he always said about the character of Barnabas is Barnabas was a very multifaceted character and he had to play all kinds of emotions. But what the media emphasized was the fangs, the vampire images fangs. And so when, for example, he went into an audition for a commercial, this is after Dark Shadows had gone off, and they looked at him and said, Mr. Frid, do your thing. And he said, I don't have a thing. I'm an actor, give me a character to play, give me a script to perform. But again, this is where, oh, vampire, Dracula, Bella Lugosi, what's that thing that you do? Because obviously it was a toothpaste commercial. I don't know, I guess they wanted a vampire. Um, so he would, he was very, that would be, you know, he was frustrated, he was annoyed. Um, so he did step away for a while after he did two movies. Um, one was The Devil's Daughter with Shelley Winters and Belinda Montgomery, which was a TV movie. And then he did Seizure, which the original script really appealed to him because it was really looking psychologically at this writer who created characters and then in his dreams came to life um, and haunted him. And it really was an analysis of the character. The film, unfortunately, because the creatures that he's created sort of are, take focus um, and it becomes kind of just a horror movie. Um, but it's interesting because Oliver Stone, who directed it, um, who recently, I, I was looking at his biography, he doesn't mention very much about Seizure. And when he does, there's a lot of complicated, it was his first film, it was shot in Montreal. Um, they lost the budget in the middle of filming. There were a lot of behind the scenes complications. But he actually, I guess now at like the age of 70, was looking back at his first two films, which was Seizure and The Hand with Donald Sutherland, and saying that both lead characters are not likable men. Um, so it's interesting that I think there was an, Jonathan was very fascinated by, you know, this evil men do, is like the simple evils in life, lying to your friend, you know, cheating on your wife. Those to him were the worst evils. Yeah, you know, slasher movies, he's off. Oh, I don't want to watch those, waste my time. That's not real, to him, real horror was the day-to-day -day sad way in which sometimes people treat the people they love. So um, I think that's what drew him to that script. And I think it's a kiss performance is really quite wonderful. Um, and there's scenes with Christina Pickles, uh, his wife, that I just, there's really some really great moments in there. But of course, again, as I say, it sort of falls into the focus on the creepy characters. Um, but in any case, he was offered a third film and then by then he just said, enough already. Um, I'm just gonna take a break. And um, he let his agent go. And that's very, when an actor doesn't have an agent or a manager, how do you get your jobs? You need someone to be telling you, oh, you know, this episodic needs a character, you know, these particular character of a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it might be. So he stepped away from that for a while. Um, he did do some theater. He did stage readings of his friends' plays. He moved um, from an uptown apartment downtown. He did some traveling. I mean, he was busy doing things, but people didn't really hear about it, and he was quite content. Uh, and then there was this time when he suddenly thought about I do want to go back and really focus on the stage. And he decided it would be a one-man show, which of course many actors do. Um, and uh, Anthony Zerbe is one of the people I interviewed for the documentary. He had a one-man show and he also did a two-person show that he toured. Uh, so it's, it's something that I think, you know, in the soul of many actors is to try that. And, uh, uh, and so that's what he he'd focused on was the stage. And of course, the other thing that happened, well, I was working with him as one day I got a call from an agent named Bob Waters who said, our Snick and Olace, which was on Broadway at the time, is recasting the four major roles. Uh, they're gonna go on national tour. And so anyway, he said Jonathan would be great for John the Brewster and Jonathan did that a couple of weeks on Broadway and then toured and loved it. And um, said, you know, one of the best years of his life was when he toured Our Snick and Olace, which was to the major cities across the country. And then also he would do his one man show on like Monday nights off in a smaller theater in the city he was in, Chicago, Philadelphia, and just had this incredible time. Because those shows are very different. Um, 
And uh, he loved, he realized he loved a long run. Being able to play arsenic for uh, like almost a year, well, I guess it was actually more than a year, um, he realized almost like that was what the best thing was for him. Having a soap opera, you have to learn a new script every day. And he struggled with learning lines. But when you're in a play, you've got weeks to learn it. And then if you're touring, you keep doing that same show over and over. He was never bored. He said he would still find little nuances even six months after doing the role. And he loved that. He never was someone, oh, I have to do that play again tonight. He was thrilled to be able to be in a long running show. Well, you know, uh, he and Grayson would have to run lines after the taping every day, well, yes. every working day. And mm -hmm. that was a constant problem. So I can definitely see why the theater would have been, a, it was for both of them. They both much preferred the theater. Yes. And of course, yeah. it was Jonathan's great passion and yeah. Yeah. Grayson also preferred it. But yeah. uh, fortunately, with actors, even though you love the theater, the, it is, it is after all show business. So you mm -hmm. have to pay attention to the business side of things. Yeah. I must tell you, someone just uh, reminded me in chat about um, the first time Jonathan appeared at a Dark Shadows convention. I don't know if you've heard this or not. Um, the Shadow Con in 1982? It yeah. wasn't. And I was in the room. And uh, I will never forget the moment he walked in. Because mm -hmm. there's something very different about your childhood heroes. And there's a, a, an innocence to it. And a you know, it, it's just much more integral to your personality somehow. And I got to know uh, both Jonathan and Grayson. I was fortunate in that respect. Yeah. Not many people in fandom have had that opportunity with Grayson, but I did with Jonathan. And when he walked into the room and all of these people who had loved him as children were in tears. I mean, sobbing, <laughs> because at that point, we had thought he was out of fandom and we would never see him. And when he entered the room, it was, I still recall it. And I have met many celebrities and that sort of thing since then, that nothing will ever equal walking up and shaking Jonathan's hand. Uh -huh. And I told him, I said, I loved you then, and I love you now. And he leaned over and gave me a kiss on the cheek. He truly was one who appreciated his fans and, and acknowledged them and thanked them. And yes, it was yourself, Maria Barbosa, Kathy Resch, Marcy Robin, who were the ones that really contacted him and told him how much they would greatly appreciate, the fans would appreciate him coming. And then once he did, he really did enjoy himself. Um, yeah. And he was then, you know, always Shadow Con, and then became, became the, there was the Dark Shadows Festival, it was a Manhattan group for a while too. So he was really enjoying going to these events and what he was doing, of course, was doing, first it was just readings, uh, general readings, and then he would shape, as he was shaping a show together, he would do a complete show. Um, so he just was really having, as a matter of fact, in a Grayson Hall story, I remember shortly after she died and I was working with Jonathan, he said, it's so sad to lose her because he said, I would have loved to have her at a fan convention and be on stage together with her. And that would have been great fun. Um, yes, he had, as you know, um, during Dark Shadows, he would go to Grayson's for dinner sometimes. She was a wonderful cook and she'd cook and they'd have dinner and then they'd run lines together. Um, because he did suffer from dyslexia, although he never talked about, he never talked about any problem he was having. He was very much in that way, you know, thought, I'm just keeping it to myself. Um, he didn't ever really complain about a health issue um, or dyslexia. He just used to say, I have a hard time with lines. Um, in my research, I also discovered his brother Ken did as well, but Ken worked very hard and became a civil engineer. Also very difficult when you um, are struggling with dyslexia. But no self-pity from Jonathan. He just said, I'm going to work harder. And he worked incredibly hard. This is the other thing that I 
realize, but more even looking back, he had to work harder than anybody else to understand what was on the page and learning lines. And he would keep working on methods that would help him. And even in a play too, I mean, it was constantly, he had to be very intense and spend hours and hours. Um, one time he said, he mentioned that at what the structure was, of course, um, as you sort of mentioned, is after they had their episode for the day at four o'clock, they would go into the rehearsal hall, the actors for the next day's episode. So there maybe were a few who worked that day that would come in in costume, and then there were others that were just coming in for that reading. And they would go through and read the script, and that's where sometimes they would say, we need to make cuts for time, we'll be sending you changes. Um, and that literally someone that, like Catherine Lee Scott, would be going out the door saying, okay, I got my lines down. <laughs> or I'll, I'll just memorize them in the cab and I'm going out tonight. And Jonathan would just think, okay, I'm going home to face hours of trying to study to get these lines in my head. Um, but again, he, he didn't complain. He certainly mentioned in many in interviews that he was the slowest study in the world. Um, but he, he, he was bound to determine to work on it. I mean, he had a passion. He loved acting and he had a talent. It just would require a tremendous amount of effort on his part throughout his career, whether it was a stage play or TV, to learn those lines. And I think that going back to his childhood, I mean, and they didn't really understand it. I mean, you know, he's born in 1924, he's in elementary school in the 30s. Um, so he was identified as I think young people with dyslexia were with, you know, oh, you must be lazy, you know, so his self-esteem was definitely impacted. And I one time heard him refer to himself as lazy and I thought, no, he's anything but. He's incredibly hardworking, but it's a label that I think sometimes psychologically sticks with you, um, and um, which, is, which is sad, but again, um, they're not, you know, the understanding wasn't there. So they said, okay, you're not working hard enough, but he worked incredibly hard. And when he got cast in a play at school, I mean, he just, he forget my classes. I want to learn all my lines. You know, that became his focus, which wasn't necessarily, um, you know, uh, help him in his classwork. But. Exactly. Well, the, I have a question yes. for you. Uh, I actually, poor Valerie has been trying to ask question. Hi, Valerie. No. No, it's my fault. I have been oh. looking. Um, did Jonathan have any input on the into the actors chosen for Arsenic and Lights? No, no. Jonathan was called um, by, as I mentioned, this agent Bob Waters uh, for the role, and then um, they were looking for actors. The Gene Stapleton had just done it on Broadway. The four other actors who at the time were uh, Tony Roberts, Polly Holiday, um, uh, Abe Vigoda, who had been, of course, on Dark Shadows, um, and Bill Hickey. Those four actors chose to not go on tour. And those are the four roles they wanted to replace with actors who were known for a television role. That was a, something the producers for the tour felt would bring people into a play that had been around. I mean, Arsenic and Alice was from the 40s. And so bringing new life into it, they wanted to pull audiences using actors. So, so Marion Ross, Happy Days, um, uh, Larry Storch, F Troop, Jonathan Dark Shadows, of course, and um, uh, Gary Sandy had been on WKRP in Cincinnati, who's actually Jonathan thought was an amazing comedian. Um, so the casting people with the producers you know, reached out to these actors and then offered them the roles Jonathan went in and met them all. Uh, he didn't have any say in um, choosing of them. He would, just went in and met his fellow actors. And again, it was a very short rehearsal time. They were told to you know, go and see the performances. It was running on Broadway. And then that uh, they really only had you know a couple of weeks during the day to get on stage and rehearse it. And then boom, they opened on Broadway. And Jonathan did feel that it wasn't his best work his first two weeks on Broadway because he still wasn't completely confident in the understanding of the lines and the characters. He feels it was uh, a couple of weeks later because they toured, I think it was Louisville, Kentucky first and then DC. I think he went to DC, he felt 100% confident in the role. But that was again, his his uh, self-esteem of like, oh, I'm not, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Um, but he also, I mean, because the way he approached, interesting in terms of theater, he really 
always felt, let me know the character. I want to completely understand the character, his history, um, all darks and light sides of him. And then the lines would help, he'd help him learn the lines that way. And um, so with Barnabas, it was like, let me understand the character. What is he doing every day? He's lying. <laughs> he's pretending to be this cousin from England and he's a vampire from you know 1795. So um, he was often, how do you play the lie? And um, that was what he always when he got a character and he'd, he'd be analyzing that. Um, and in the show stories he would read in this is one man show. It was like, let me take, the, let me take apart these characters. Um, and um, that's how he really, and that was his, you know, how he created the characters and made them successful. You know? All right, now in translating a life like Jonathan's into the documentary, hmm. You had so much to pull for. How do you distill that down into something that's that's workable? Uh, well, I had an interesting conversation. I was at a, um, Catherine Lee Scott had a reading of one of her new books. It was um, September Girl. Um, I shouldn't say reading. It was promotional for her book and a book signing. And um, uh, Laura Parker was there, and I happened to be talking to her just as I was starting. Um, I took a couple. I was still in the midst of doing research for the documentary in 2019, and having her. I mean, I was interesting. Of course, both of them are writers, and uh, so I was just talking to her about like how did she think you approach something like a documentary? And she said, "Know the story you want to tell," and that was incredibly insightful because that was what I had to think about. Because as you've said, here's all these um, existing interviews, here's interviews I've already shot, and what is it? And so I actually, at the heart of Jonathan, his passion was to act. And I tell the story from there. Well, there you go. And, you know, I, I'm remembering an interview someone had with Orson Welles. Yeah. And you were talking about uh, this this particular writer was writing his biography. And uh, Wells said, well, you really can't. You can't tell my story because only God can tell my story. You know? yeah. And God in whatever sense. And he says, but you can tell your experience of relating my story. And so I guess in that sense, as you were saying, in finding the story you want to tell, that's putting yourself somehow into the picture in order to relate the story of Jonathan Frick. Right. And, and then, by talking people who worked with him, you right. get also insight to how they took him in and how, what was the experience for them to work with him. And yes. you interviewed a lot of people for it, I know. Yes, well, I did. I mean, I, I did feel that there are a lot of existing interviews with the Dark Shadows actors. So I decided to start beyond that. And as I mentioned, interviewed Anthony Zerbe, who has then done numerous movies and television. I mean, Star Trek Insurrection, this is on the TV series Harry O, and won a, day to, and won a Nighttime Emmy Award. Um, and he had worked with Jonathan on the stage. Um, they had worked together in Philadelphia, Theater for the Living Arts. and. And these are so impressed with him. He said, look, I'm going to be going to the Old Globe Theater in San Diego this summer, and I want to connect you to them because I think you should come there and do Shakespeare. And uh, so he was the connection that got Jonathan in the summer of 1966 to the Old Globe in San Diego. Um, Christina Pickles played his wife in Seizure. It was her very first movie. And Jonathan, of course, had only done the Dark Shadows movie prior to that in terms of a major role. And um, they had both gone to Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts um, a few years apart. I mean, amazingly, Christina Pickles was selected when she was 15 years old. Um, and when you think most people are more college age or older that go there, I was really surprised by that. So ultimately, they were like a few years apart, um, but they talked talk stories. And I had remembered when I worked with Jonathan, the, who he talked about was Josina Pickles and Joe Sorolla, who um, were who he would often have dinner with. Those were the two actors that um, Joe Sorolla too. He had been a Broadway actor, a number of shows. He ended up at the end of his life being a Broadway producer and winning a Tony Award. Um, so I, um, uh, and he had passed, so I couldn't interview him. That was the one thing. Sometimes I reach out to people 
and they had already passed, um, sometimes even just within a few months of when I was starting the project. Um, but it was um, uh, an actor. He'd been in Memphis, Tennessee, and I reached out to an actor there, uh, went to Memphis to interview him. Um, amazing memory for 90 years old. Uh, our second Elise, I went to Marion Ross, um, and uh, she had some fun stories. Um, they didn't necessarily, I wouldn't say they were like best buddies, um, because again, Jonathan sometimes would have his one man show. So in his free time, he was working on practicing his script. Um, but she's very funny. She's very, again, amazing memory, 90 years old. Um, sidebar, the day I was interviewing her, she was shooting with Gavin McLeod um, for, it was a Christmas special and the two of them were hosts and they were shooting that. And then I was sort of the tag on interview with Marion, but I got to talk to Gavin as they were waiting and he just, I had worked with his son, his son's a music director and daytime soap operas. And, um, he thought, I said, I have a connection to you. And, oh, he was just a delight and an amazing storyteller. Of course, he just passed recently, but I was delighted to have been able to spend a little time talking to him. So um, anyway, but also Yale, of course, I immediately thought of Dick Cavett uh, because I knew that he'd been on the Dick Cavett show four times and that he was good, for, that they were friends from Yale. But what I didn't know was there's also a theater story that Dick Cavett had been at the, uh, like an intern or apprentice at the American Shakespeare Festival in Stratford, Connecticut. I didn't realize that he, he actually had seen Jonathan and shows there. and. Um, so that was interesting um, to get those stories. And uh, uh, so anyway, and also another Yale person named Bob Calfin, who was a big theater person who I worked with, when I was working with Jonathan, see, he also, in, before our SNCC, he did a stage reading of a play and the director was, producer was Bob Calfin. And so I remember that and I reached out to Bob. And then I didn't really understand they had been Yale buddies. So I got terrific stories from him too. So anyway, I. I was doing all that first um, and then said, well, okay, then we can see what, what I might need to fill in from the Dark Shadows actors. Um, and of course, COVID hit. <laughs> so yes. I you know, pretty much thankfully had what I needed in terms of the interviews. Um, sometimes now I had to go rely on already established interviews. Some people had passed like John Carlin, Louis Edmonds, and I called through interviews with them. Um, and, um, and then also the archival research I had reached out to Williamstown Theater Festival, Yale, and again, pre-COVID, thankfully, because everything got shut down. Um, I did have a little bit I needed that, about the 11th hour, as we say, before I had to get this buttoned up to MPI. I, I did need a couple more pictures from a theater and I ended up getting them. Um, but uh, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been great talking and hearing stories. I didn't, I know, going up to Canada, talking to people up there. Um, there some people aren't on camera, but I learned, I got some insight that would help um, me as I move forward in the documentary. So the, I'm very excited to see it, obviously, because the dark shadow. So I look forward to hearing your response. <laughs> yeah. But also because I knew him and yeah. Certainly, as well as many fans did. Uh, he got to know, he had a lot of friends in fandom. But mm -hmm. um, I, being on the West Coast, I would see him when he was out here. But uh, it's, it's fascinating because there's always something you don't know about people you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it fascinating just reading through the notes that uh, the pre release information. No, when is it going to be released? It well, right now they do on Amazon Prime, and I guess on the MP MPI site, <clears throat> they have what they call pre-order. So you could order a DVD or Blu-ray, but those won't be shipped until the official release date, which is Tuesday, October 5th, when it will drop on Amazon Prime's digital platform, which is to rent or buy. Um, so you don't have to get the DVD of Blu-ray, you could just purchase. I don't know what that price will be. I think for the Dan Curtis doc, it was $5.99. Um, but uh, that will again also take place on October 5th, 2021. There you go. The, um, the, I'm getting like five or six different questions here. I'm trying <laughs> to, as I go, there, uh, their platform doesn't 
do well for uh, chatting. Um, someone wants to know if uh, you had ever been to Jonathan's apartment. She said she had, so uh, yes. Also Canada, I visited, uh, visited him in Canada several times. Uh, he had a lovely home, beautiful garden. Um, and then that's the thing, when he went up there to retire, <laughs> um, he was so busy. I mean, he was um, lo loved working in his garden. He was involved in what was called the Richard III Society in Canada because he was always faster than Richard III. When he had his website, he would do readings of Richard III and also talk to the fans. Um, he would do some charitable readings for different organizations. Um, he got an alumni award from McMaster University. It was funny, he got one the same year I did, even though his was 40 years later, um, and mine was probably about 20. Um, but um, yeah, he was just amazingly busy up there, and of course, still had his friends when he moved up there, friends that he'd had from childhood, would get together and, and have a great time together. Um, and then of course, as years went on, sadly, you know, those people lose those friends through, uh, through death. Uh, he, he, he really enjoyed it. Yes. Can I ask something real quick? Something I was yes, curious sir. about. Yes. During the prime of Jonathan Fred's career was kind of the prime of uh, Vincent Price and Peter Cushing and the tail end of uh, Basil Rathbone and Peter Lorre. Did he ever feel competitive with, with those actors that were doing horror movies? No. Um, no. he, he actually was, I wish this existed. He was on a talk show that Della Reese had, or maybe I should say a variety show and Vincent Price was on it and they actually talked, um, that it doesn't exist anymore. So many shows back in the day, the tape was expensive. They just taped over them. Um, so that, but no, I mean, he really was, um, Never felt, I mean, certainly when he first moved to New York and he'd be auditioning for plays, there were certain actors he would be in competition with, but um, he he never really ever really thought about himself competing like with, or with the image of Vincent Price or Bella Ghost. I mean, he had his own interpretation of Barnabas and it was not the traditional Dracula, as we all know. He created a vulnerable vampire, a, a, a guy who didn't want to be a vampire and didn't want to resist that urge for blood. Um, so it was a very different interpretation than what um, Bella Lugos Lugosi was a wonderful actor. Um, but his interpretation was completely different. John had a very, very um, different approach, which of course is what has been followed ever since with uh, the classic story interview with a vampire and then the movie and Twilight. It's the sympathetic vampires, what you're seeing. And Jonathan was really the first um, with his creation of the role of Barnabas with the writers. He was always one too. He said, well, the writers were what had to put it on. He had to be on the page for him to help bring it to life. Well, and really his, his uh, interpretation of a vampire has reflected on everyone since. Uh -huh. And you look in, he really did turn the page for not only vampires, but all horror fiction. There is a reinterpretation of horror. It, he himself said that he felt that he went more for horror than for fear, with fear being a more visceral, immediate response, and horror being something deeper and more resonant in the character. Uh -huh. And I think we've seen that, whether it's in uh, Twilight or um, any of the, it, certainly in the um, the uh, Dracula film, whose name the name of the actor is escaping me, and Debbie Smith will kill me. I can't the, think of it. The more recent, or like the we're back in Jack Palance? No, or... back in back at, like twenty or thirty years ago, he was the great redone. Uh, Dracula. But uh, anyway, Jonathan, I mean, ever since Barnabas, mm -hmm. it, he has resonated with, I think, all of horror. Yes. And it, I think Dark Shadows really did inject that in, whether it be the writers, the actors. And, um, I'm wondering what your opinion was, if you care to give it, and if you don't, that's fine too. Of Johnny Depp's interpretation, that we uh, 
I understand that there was the original writer, um, they began work and then for whatever reason, I, I, perhaps Warner Brother executives made a change and the second writer, Seth uh, Green, is that Abraham? Yeah. Um, I just know he wrote uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Slayer. Um, he decided to take it into more of a um, camp um, point of view. And I, again, I think that may have come from the network. I don't know, I wasn't involved at all, but it was not done in the way that I, I speak for myself as a fan. I don't think the original was respected. Um, I've heard that the original script did, but again, there was a big change. New writer, totally different approach. Um, that was never intended to be, Dark Shadows, the TV show, was never intended to be camp. The actors took it very seriously. Many of them were stage actors. Um, they, yes, looking at it today, you can see sometimes things appear over the top. The actors are very passionate, giving full-fledged performances. So somebody might say, okay, that's a little camp, a little funny, but it was never intended to be that way. And the problem with the Dear Johnny Depp, Tim Burton movie is it was all camp. And that's why I feel myself and certainly a number of fans who I've spoken to felt that it was just really sad that this, this doesn't represent the true Dark Shadows at all. And Barnabas Collins' character made no sense. What was he doing killing hippies who had helped him? Like Barnabas wouldn't have done that. So, um, so, so I think for the, those of us, or not necessarily all, but many of us who are original fans, really did, don't like that film. But it, you know, and it didn't do too well in the states. But internationally, it did. You know, I mean, Johnny Depp is a wonderful actor; has a, a large following. So this I think series, overseas. It, I'm sorry. No. Nope. Yeah. Uh, the series <laughs> hasn't seen uh, internationally as as it was here. I know it was in Australia and a, a few countries, but I think those of us who saw the film, and it amazes me that no one brought this up to Tim Burton beforehand, that we hold Dark Shadows very differently in our memories than other series. So you can go camp on something and laugh at it and that's fine but with dark shadows um certainly i was deeply upset with what they did with uh the julia hoffman character mm -hmm. which i thought was just and grayson would have been horrified mm -hmm. um she would have laughed herself silly but you know yeah it, i mean again i think you know when when it even if they're i don't think that once it started going in that direction, someone could have come and said, change it, you know. Um, that's what they decided they wanted to do and they moved forward with that, um, you know, to, to, as I say, the, the sadness of most of us are original fans. And I mean, there are some people who do enjoy it. I mean, perhaps as it's standing on its own, if you don't make the comparison, maybe, you know, we could say, oh, I enjoy that. But those of us that had that feeling it was hard to see. And also, of course, it's unfortunate that both Jonathan and David and Catherine and Laura had gone over there and they really are basically are glorified extras in uh, Norway. I mean, I had gone with my son and when the door opened and Johnny Depp was standing there as Barnabas and he looked at the quartet, they said, there's Jonathan. And I turned back and he's gone, <laughs> blink of an eye. Um, uh, I think that they just didn't, again, I bet the original writer had maybe incorporated them in a different way. And then when this came along and they're like, oh, we've committed them, they're all going to come. And that, But they didn't really know what to do with them, um, how to give them the moment. I mean, it's also unfortunate because I remember uh, when I talked to John on the phone, it was 2007. And he'd said, oh, wait, there's this talk about a new Dark Shadows movie, and it was funny. He said, yeah, this is actor. I guess I should know him. He's going to play Barnabas. His name is Johnny Depp. <laughs> he didn't know who he was. Um, well, if they had moved forward in 2007 or 8, um, that would have been uh, a little bit easier for Jonathan. But by 2011, he was having a lot of health issues. Um, and to put him on a plane from Toronto to London, it was like 20 hours of travel. 
was just too much for him and he was completely exhausted. Um, so it was difficult. At his age, he was 87. Yeah. 80, um, he was 86, 86. You know, I've seen Johnny Depp in a lot of stuff and watching that movie, it really seemed like Johnny Depp didn't take it seriously. Like he was just, you know, I'm getting paid to do this. So, well, I'll it, it, honest, I, but. Uh, well, apparently that he and Tim Burton had watched it when they were young, when it was first on. And, um, and Johnny Depp certainly was really thrilled to meet Jonathan and in Jonathan's obituary, Several of them had quotes where Donnie Jeff said, I was so happy that I had the opportunity to meet him um, because he too had, you know, admired him as we're describing earlier, you know, the fans in that auditorium who had seen the original show and Jonathan walks in and that just so touches their heart. So I think he really was happy to be with Jonathan, but he was very focused on playing this. I mean, Johnny Depp too strikes me as an actor who really looks at the character and analyzes who is this character, such as we all think of Pirates of Caribbean. I mean, he created a very unique character, probably wasn't that way originally. Um, and so I think he locks in and goes with it. So he was true to what he decided the character was, but it wasn't the Barnabas we knew and loved. Uh, you couldn't compare, they were so different. I also think they, they may have focused heavily on House of Dark Shadows and uh, oh. took <coughs> you know, from that point of view. And I am being reminded we're almost at the top of the hour, which means we're out of time. Okay. Very quickly, can you sum up how we can get the documentary and see it and anything else you'd like to relate? Um, well, I will really, really look forward to hearing um, fans uh, comments after they view the documentary. You can come on Jonathan Frid Doc Facebook page and uh, let me know your thoughts. Um, it was definitely uh, two years of a passion project for me. I wanted to honor Jonathan's legacy uh, and hope that you will find that I did. Um, so October 5th, 2021, it will be released um, for rent or buy on Amazon Prime. And then again, you can pre-order DVDs or Blu-rays or order them after you see it. <laughs> so um, it should be around for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Melody, for inviting me to be with you today. Nice to meet you, Mark. May I ask a quick question? Yes, Mark. Melody, when was the last Shadow Con? Last Shadow Con or the Dark Shadows Festival? Well, either one. Is that Shadow, Shadow Con was just uh, in the early 80s, but the Dark Shadows Festival came into their own 1984 and went through 2016, was the 50th anniversary of Dark Shadows, and that was the last Dark Shadows Festival. 2016. It's amazing. Mary, you've been such a wonder. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. We hope to have you back again, maybe after the documentary. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too, hon. Bye-bye. Okay, Mark. So next we week. We still on the air or are you, yes, we off the air? We're still on the air. We're wrapping up now. <laughs> uh, we're going to be about two minutes over, but we were two minutes late. So. <laughs> well, you know, you know, she's very interesting. She's wonderful. She, she's yeah. a big person. You should sit down and talk to her. She, she can go on for hours about stuff. She's very <laughs> So You ever yeah. think of starting Shadow Con back up? No. I don't think so. Well, they might. Who knows? Because I've been giving some thought to doing a toy show. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. uh, you, I think you went to StarCon, didn't you, once? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, you have to understand, Mark, I was one of the people who started Dark Shadow. Oh, yeah, you were already into it, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. With, but, with okay. the movie and, the you know, the, the, the popularity of conventions and stuff, I, I just wondered if that might not be something to do why not that's <laughs> next week is just gonna rent a hole <laughs> yeah, yeah. skinwalker ranch there you go our friend billy crook who will be who lives in the area and has hiked all over it so we'll hear all about that and thank you mark for being here and thank you all of you for being with us and uh, we'll see you next week